Hello. Welcome to Salem the Podcast. We are your hosts and favorite Salem tour guides. My name is Sarah Black. And I'm Jeffrey Lilly. Today, we're going to be talking about another trial victim, Rebecca Nurse. We've got more trial stuff to talk about. So the last one was Bridget Bishop. We're moving forward, tackling yet again another victim of the Salem Witch Trials. But first, we got some announcements and tour time. Oh, yeah. You know you love it. So first and foremost, we just hit 20,000 downloads. Which is ridiculous. Insane. So thank you. Like a lot. I don't even have words. It's pretty cool. And so that's all of you listening, all of you who've downloaded, all of you who shared. You've told your friends. You've put it on their car when you're when you're driving with your friends. You, you know, showed your parents how to download it. I don't know. <laughs> whatever it was, whatever you did. Uh, that's on all of you, and uh, we're really glad that you're enjoying uh, what we have to offer. Yes, thank you so much. I don't think either you or I anticipated a positive response like this. Like, I, I, I don't know. I like what we talk about. You like what we talk about. Yeah, but like every, there's so many podcasts out there. You there's never like know. There's loads of people who come to Salem to listen to what we talk about that like, I knew, I knew, okay. I hoped it was going to be good. You prepared for the best. I prepared for the worst. Maybe yeah. that's just the way that we, we yeah. are. But, but I am thankful t- nonetheless. Timeline also. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Right. For, I, four months. I was like, hey, I wouldn't, uh, you know, maybe six, eight after October. Right. After we got a big. You right. Know, the, the maybe season. after the first year. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, again. Thank you. We appreciate you. Um, oh, we, we did, we did go out and celebrate real quick for that though. Oh yeah. We, we yeah. spent some time on the tiki boat again, which again, as, as always was, was fantastic. And that was just actually coincidental. I, I had tickets again. Uh, so that's how we spent our celebration time. Um, but we did get up to some fun little witchy stuff. Yes, we did. The witchery to be exact. Yeah. So we do like to play tourists in our own city once in a while. And uh, Jeffrey had a friend coming in to visit. So what better chance to bring them to something that neither of us have done before? Yeah, she was like, I want to do like witch stuff. And I was like, okay, we'll do witch stuff. Uh, so we went to w- the uh, the witchery and made brooms. So they do a broom making class. You get to pick out your your handle, your stick. Um, they got three different sizes. You pick out your broom corn and then all the little fixings. They have dried arrangements and colors. And it was just a really, really cool experience. Very hands-on. Literally hands-on. Yeah. And yeah. we left with the most beautiful brooms. Yeah, I, think. I don't know if... I, I'm, I'm sure there is something else in the city where you get like a s- similar, like I walked away with a thing. So often when you do a thing, right, you you don't walk away with a thing. It's just the experience. Yeah. It's like, oh, this was fun. I went on on, on this tour. I went to this museum. You know, I, I went to a gift shop and like I bought a thing, but like we made a thing. Yeah. It was yeah. really neat. Yeah. Something so. that will adorn our walls 100%. Yeah. I'm sitting here looking looking at mine and I'm like, how do I get that on the wall? And uh, you guys went and took a little venture off to <laughs> the, uh, the the water for the moonlight, right? Yeah. So we also, uh, it coincidentally uh, uh, was the full moon. Yeah. We made brooms on the full moon. Just yeah, saying. Yeah. Because it, again, it's coincidental. Uh, my, my friend's trip had been postponed, so it, it happened to fall. Uh, at there this... are no coincidences. Okay, fine. It was all faded. She happened to come here when we had tickets for the Tiki Hut boat so we could go and we could do that. And then it was faded that we would make brooms on the night, day of the full moon. And then that night, because you got to do a witchy shit on top of witchy shit, uh, we went down to the ocean. And as the full moon, moon rose, we, we just sort of dipped our brooms in the ocean. Epic, <laughs> which was pretty fun. Um, that was that was cool. Welcome to Salem, the podcast. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, so a big thank you and shout out to the witchery. Know what time it is? Tour time. It's tour time. Tour corner. Tour time. Tour times later tonight. We'll we'll figure it out eventually. Okay. Okay. Well, <laughs> or it'll just be a continuous thing where every episode we can't figure it out. Which is fine. One or the other. This is our podcast. We can do whatever we want. (laughs) 
<laughs> um, so I, I do have a, a quick tour story for you. Lay it on me. I'm not going to tell you. What? What? Something cool happened on tour. Okay. Yeah. With, with, with some cool people. Okay. They're listeners. Okay. They said they're coming for you next. Oh, shit. <laughs> what? <laughs> Are you serious? I've been waiting like four days to tell you this. <laughs> What? What? You're. That's it. That's you, all you're giving me. Yeah, I, I. I could share. It's fun. It's just fun. I, I no, could not, share with now. Now I want to be surprised. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Weird. <laughs> yeah. I. I will report back when something Wait. bizarre happens. It's not bizarre. It's not bizarre. It's, it's fun. It was fun. Yeah. Yeah. They give you glitter. They did not give me glitter. Okay. No. Then we're good. Okay. <laughs> 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 Who knows? That maybe they'll give you glitter. <laughs> Dude, no, that was your story. <laughs> uh, Shower, look. Jeffrey, and glitter. <laughs> no, you're like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that 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 is my tour story. That's all I got. I don't really have too much to share. Um, tours were very generic. That sounds terrible. Not not anything against my audience members. They were standard fun, standard entertaining, fun. good, good people. Exactly. Yeah. Had a lot of teenagers recently, a lot of kids, and um, just been very impressed. When it's kids, you don't really know what you're going to get. Uh, some of them latch on very quickly to the subject matter, and they're totally invested. And then some of them, you just never really get there. And I get that. Some, you know, it's history, yeah, right? Some yeah. some kids hate history for their whole lives, and you can't change it. But these kids recently have been so invested. I had one girl explain ergot poisoning to me, like on tour in front of everyone. And like, I felt so bad because I had to then tell her that you're it, wrong. But then I made it a point be like, well, now you get to go around and tell people if they ever try to explain ergot to you, you can say, oh, no, no, no. It was actually tossed out because of this, this and this. Yeah. So it was a, a good productive interaction. I will say I had one review come in on TripAdvisor and, um, I'm assuming it was left by one of these kids and she said she turned over to her mom at one point during the tour and said, I want to be just like her. And I tell you what, I almost cried. (laughs) That's so sweet. Yeah. As a young woman in this field, I think we can all agree that um, the history field and academia in general is Historically, it is male dominated. Mm -hmm. So for me to be able to go out and tell history in a fun way that makes an impact and for those kids to be able to walk away and say, hmm, maybe I can do this with my life or maybe I should, you know, follow my passions. It just it warms my heart. And it's probably one of the best parts about this job. Yay. Yay. That's pretty cool. Yeah. I'll tuck that one away forever. Is that it? Is that it? Maintenance? Is that it for maintenance? I think so. Okay. Let's proceed. We shall continue. So we have planned out this year's worth of episodes. We had done so ahead of time before we really dove into recording. Um, Things have changed along the way, but this was one of those episodes where we selected it for a reason, Mm -hmm. um, and it's coming out at a specific time. So this episode... Focusing on Rebecca Nurse, one of the trial victims, is going to be airing, is airing, you're, you should be listening to it, possibly, on July 19th, 2022. So this is the 330th, uh, or marks the 330th year uh, since the execution of five people uh, within the scope of the Salem Witch Trials. The first, of course, we've talked about is Bridget Bishop on June 10th. And then they hold a, a plethora of, of hearings. There's more arrests. There's more accusations. Uh, we can now come to a sort of second round of trials. And uh, the execution date for some of those who have been found guilty falls on uh, July 19th. Alongside Rebecca Nurse, Sarah Good, Elizabeth Howe, Susanna Martin, and Sarah Wilds. And we should also uh, bring up real quick that between these two uh, execution dates, uh, two more people uh, have lost their lives. That's going to be Roger Toothaker. Uh, he dies in jail, as well as the infant child of Sarah Good. Uh, she also dies in jail, probably 
within a week or two before uh, her mother's executed. So when talking about Rebecca Nurse, I think this name in particular sticks out to a lot of folks. When you're talking about the trials, she is one of the principal um, victims. Probably like like, like top three, top five. Yeah, alongside Giles Corey, Bridget Bishop, the first one to be executed. Her name is so, so well known for a variety of reasons. I mean, I I think the top reason uh, might, might be the Crucible. Yeah, definitely. If you've seen that movie or read the book uh, by Arthur Miller, his play, she is one of the main Ca- characters, I, I protagonist, accused. antagonist, plot. You know, yeah, she's yeah. one of the main uh, names that, that he uses in that. Um, and we're not going to touch on that at the moment, though. Uh, we're going to uh, table that, uh, as, as it were, because we're going to have a whole episode dedicated to the Crucible and Arthur Miller and sort of weaving in and out of the historical inaccuracies there. We did get a couple of requests from listeners to do a comparison uh, between these real trials and the Crucible. So very much appreciate that suggestion. And we are working it into the schedule, probably going to fall sometime this year. Yeah. But today we're going to talk about what really happened here in 1692. But before we do, we want to give you some backstory on Rebecca Nurse and her life prior to that fateful year. Yeah, who is she? She was born on February 13th, 1621 in Great Yarmouth, England to William and Joanna Town. So Great Yarmouth, for those of you who are wondering, sits on the uh, far east coast of, of the United Kingdom. So if you look at a map of England, uh, you have the, the English Channel, and as it sort of uh, passes France, and then we go into the North Sea, right there in that little nub on the uh, bottom right corner of England is, is Great Yarmouth. Her and her family moved to the Massachusetts Bay Colony in the mid-1630s. I saw a variety of dates, anywhere from six thir- 1635 to like 1639 or so. Yeah. I saw 1636 at one point, Um, but what we do know is that her father acquires a piece of property in 1640, Uh, so we can pretty pretty accurately say that by that point, they're here. And that would put her in her late teens when she comes over to (laughs) to the colony, which I just imagine what her and her family encountered when they got here. Uh, This is still, I mean, it was it was frontier country in the 90s, in the 1690s. But at this point, I mean, in in, in the 90s, too. uh (laughs) (laughs) Which frontier country? Uh Um, But at this point. You know, they're at the beginnings of this of this establishment here. So they would have been she would have seen decades of development in this area. And what, what's kind of neat, uh, I think, uh, what it must have been like to, to cross the Atlantic with a 17 year old teen child, uh, <laughs> which I think sounds, attra- you know, for, for those of us, you know, let's go on like a four hour car ride. And you're like, oh, my good God. <laughs> I never even thought about that. <laughs> they're going on a two month ocean voyage. Um but I think uh, at this point, the uh, Massachusetts Bay Colony is established. Um, so we're past the Pilgrims, past the Winthrop Fleet, you know, not by much. They're getting at the tail end of, of that decade of, of the uh, Puritan uh, migration over here. But things are really at this point starting to get going like, like, like that. It's been sort of a slow, steady, and now we're really getting into uh, like a, a, full, a full evolution uh, of of that colonization uh, I- idea here. We should note that she comes from a pretty big family. Mm-hmm. She was one of six. She had two sisters and three brothers, and there's quite a bit of longevity in her family. She herself will go on to have eight children, all of which live into adulthood. Which is weird. Yeah, during this time, that was pretty rare. Yeah. Um, I-, I don't know if I've mentioned it before. On the podcast, Cotton Mather, his kids. I don't. He he has fifteen. <laughs> um, oh, be- Cotton. Between two wives, and I, I haven't, I don't have, I haven't mentioned this in a while. So forgive me if I get this kind of wrong. Um, I believe only two outlive him. Wow. So uh, thirteen of his children die before he passes away, um, and I think about half of those die in infancy. 
I think we've talked yeah. for sure on the podcast about just being around death. Yeah. It was so common back then. I think we've all heard that phrase, a uh, parent should never have to bury their children. Yeah. But during this time. It was all too common. Yep. Unfortunately. Um, no, she's got eight that live and you're like, that, that's a little weird. Yeah. And for a woman to live through childbirth that many times as well, that was a feat in itself. She had married Francis Nurse in 1644. Now, he was a tray maker, um, basically made furniture and other goods from wood, uh, was fairly well respected in mm-hmm. town, involved in his community. At this point, the Nurse family is establishing a good spot here. And when we say here, we should also specify where here is. So the trials themselves took place in Salem town, but Rebecca and her husband, Francis, they're at the time of the trials living on a farm in what was then Salem village Mm -hmm. or what is today Danvers. And and they've been around Salem, uh, the family land uh, up in um, Ipswich. Uh, So it's not, again, just condensed to here in Salem, uh, these issues, uh, or sorry, well, these people are settling all over the, the, the land in this area. And so therefore their issues are, are going to stem from, from things that happen all over this land. It's a very well connected community. It is small. It's tight knit. Um, everyone knows everybody at this point, Salem village where she's living. You're only looking at about like four to 500 people tops, She is living on about 300 acres with her her husband on that property. She is also leasing to several of her adult children. So So. so they've got houses. It's not like um, it's not like a small town, right? So it's not like you know five rows of houses and they're all living down the street from each other or like right next door. They're they're living on the property. So it's probably you know within on that 300 acres um, and within that area. So that's uh, sort of a basis for who she is and, and where she is at this point. And now we're going to jump straight into 1692. Um, so real quick, at this point, uh, if you are just joining us <laughs> and are totally unfamiliar with the Salem Witch Trials, uh, go back and check out some of our other episodes that delve uh, much deeper into that, our intro into the Witch Trials episode, or even our two episodes on Bridget Bishop, because uh, we talk a lot about... Um, some of the initial accusations, uh, what's going on, the temperament of the community, uh, social economic issues, and the formation of the court that is going to start to hear all these trials. Welcome back. (laughs) (laughs) Whispers of Rebecca Nurse being a witch first began in mid-March. Her main first accusers were Anne Putnam Jr., Abigail Williams, and Anne Putnam Sr. So you probably have heard us mention these names before. If you've listened to our other episodes, Abigail Williams in particular is the niece of Reverend Paris. So Mm -hmm. she is in the household with Betty Paris, with Tichaba, and she is part of that initial... She's one of the first two suffering, one of the first two to make accusations. Right. And, uh, you know, she's an interesting character in in and of herself. And... uh, her narrative uh, drives a a lot of what happens uh, through these trials. And when it comes to the Putnams, now this is Anne Putnam senior and junior. So mother and daughter, both pointing the finger at uh, Rebecca nurse. This is one of those things you and I had been having a conversation prior to recording about like why the Putnams and it's, it's mixed. It's a little muddy. We, we don't have, an exact reason. Yeah. So when we say like we're missing bits and pieces of the trials, some of it comes down to just people's temperaments and backstories and attitudes. And and you don't know every conversation that's occurred at a tavern or over dinner or why someone doesn't like someone else. Um, Maybe it's, it's jealousy. Maybe it's just fear mongering or spite. Or, or whatever, but it seems here it's pretty clear that the Puttons don't like Rebecca Nurse. There has been some speculation that uh, because she had had so many successful births and her children had lived into adulthood, that perhaps 
there was that jealousy there. Anne Putnam Sr. had lost a child, and one of her uh, children had also lost a child. So their family had suffered loss. And, you know, in a world where you blame everything either on the devil or God, why is it that that woman gets to have all of her children and I don't? And in addition to that, um, I wanted to note here, there is a lease-to-buy situation on the nurse property at this time. So Rebecca and Francis, they don't own that property outright, but they are leasing it. And they're good on their lease. They're making their payments. But I think oftentimes there's this narrative that follows the trials, and it's this idea that You know, you could just take someone's stuff if you accuse them of witchcraft. And maybe since the nurses are living on this 300 acre farm, well, perhaps if they are accused, people can take their stuff. That just was not what was happening. Um, And they didn't even own the property outright. So uh, eventually, and I think this is, this might be where that theory comes from. It will eventually go to Putnam's. But it's not those Putnams. But it, it, it so. goes to Putnams 100, 120 years later. Right. But someone and, might and, look at that and be and like. legally. Right. Right, right, and, right. And no, no malice, no miscontent, no lawsuits, no, you know, your great, great grandmother, the, nothing like that. It's just, I mean, arguably at the end of the day, it's, it's a coincidence. Yes, um, indeed. But when it comes to, to these sorts of things, uh, we know that there are land issues and property line issues and property line disagreements and, uh, you know, these sorts of things, which tend to be settled. Uh, but also, even though they are quote unquote settled, there's still some begrudgment of, of these things. And I, I don't know. I, I just. It's those interpersonal relationships. <sighs> But I, I, I can't see, right? You're like, oh, okay. So, you know, when my dad's property up in Ipswich, you know, and the town line had to be redrawn and we lost, you know, a hundred acres and you're like, yeah, I guess that's shitty. But like, is that reason to accuse someone of being a witch and have them hanged? Like, I, I, I don't know. No, but here's where it starts you're talking about these issues in the household and then your young children overhear these names and they think, oh, look at this. I can point the finger at this individual and it's going to make sense amongst my my family. Yeah. Which so is this malcontent is sort of brewing. And then, well, that's exactly what happens with, with uh, Abigail Williams and, and Betty Paris is that they hear these names that they've discussed at the dinner table and then that's who they start to point the finger at and then I guess it's very small jumps for the adults in the community to be like, well, I guess that makes sense because this land issue, this other issue, this pig issue. <laughs> yeah, we'll get to the pig <laughs> issue in a second. Now, up until this point, a lot of the names that had been brought forth by the girls, these are outcasts. Um, if we recall to the first three, Sarah Good, Sarah Osborne, and Tichaba, they were kind of on the fringes of society. Sarah Good being, you know, poor beggar. Sarah Osborne not having been to to church in a long while. Invalid. She was poorly. Yeah. Her health was declining. And then a slave. Yep. An enslaved individual. And all three of them fit our common or current narrative of witches are outside the community people. Right. Right. And they like that, that fits in. Oh, they're, they're these, you know, crones. They're in the woods. They're discontent. They're, no one likes them. They, everyone casts suspicious on them. They, 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 you know, have, have been outcast from the community for a litany of reasons. But those first three fit that narrative. It's easy to point the finger yeah. at them. Rebecca Nurse doesn't. No, if anything, she is the exact opposite within this community. She is what they would call a covenant member of the church. So the the, the Puritan church, Puritans are weird, if you haven't picked up on that. Uh, their religious structure is, is weird. All religious beliefs are complicated. And uh, they believe your path into heaven is preordained. Uh, so you may or may not. However... To ensure that if you are, that you get there while living, you have to complete a list of things. 
And once you've completed that list of things, you are considered a, a pious or a coveted member of the church. So you've checked. It's like taking a test is the wrong or passing an exam, right? You're like, I've done all the things. You have certain requirements. Yeah. Like baptism. Yeah. Like like a public confession, full, actually. Full and public confession in front of the entire church. Yeah. There there was no little little closet you go in with the priest. Like you had to pretty much let loose your sins mm -hmm. in front of the entire congregation. Um, so only a select few individuals were considered covenant members of the church. Yeah. And it took a lot. So it's like, it's not like no one was ostracized or kept from this position but there was a lot of work you had to do to get there and the respect that came with it i would say paralleled that work um i i had seen one reference that it was almost like they're saints uh in the eyes of their congregation or at yeah. least the closest you could get yeah like and because you know to hit this hit this mark, this person has been putting the work in for years and years and years, and they've maintained their, their, their ideas and their reputation. They've been to church. They've taken faith. They have done all the things that, that have been required of them by God, and they have reached this stature. And so there is, there's this measure of respect. There's this measure of devotion. And Rebecca Nurse is one of these people. So that makes her so unique to have someone that is so deeply rooted in this church among them. For them to be in league with the devil, uh, yeah, I, shocking to say the very least. What I find more shocking, and I think you'll agree, is that they accept these accusations. Yeah. Right? They don't turn around and go, you must, you 12-year-old child must be mistaken. It could not possibly be Rebecca Nurse. Because I can very clearly see the narrative where it must be that that the child must be mistaken, and then it's not Rebecca Nurse, and all of a sudden another old seventy-one-year-old woman's arrested. Right, or right? maybe then the threads begin to unravel, and they very well could have taken this as a opportunity to get out. Like yeah. they could have used this as a yeah. a moment to say, "Wait a minute, girls, you're wrong. This doesn't make sense," and then they could have dismantled it. But I personally, I think that they were already in too deep. They had already brought people forth for questioning on March 1st. Remember Sarah Good, Sarah Osborne, Tichaba. There was already people that knew this was happening. Word was spreading. Rumors are boiling. I mean, it was just they were already in too deep. It's unfortunate, though, because no one had died at that point. Like, by the time of Rebecca Nurse's arrest on March 23rd, Bridget Bishop, she's not dead. They could have stopped it. Yeah. Yeah. They just, but but instead, they decided to push full steam ahead. And I think this is where we get into, I mean, we could make, you know, some compare contrast allegories to, you know, modern day conspiracy theories. Um, but now it becomes, now it is easier for you to disregard that woman's piety and instead say this is a an explanation for the things that have been happening in the community. Instead of the logical answer that, that this woman who has, you know, held the faith for her entire life and, and is a staunch pillar of, of God, it's easier for you to go, well, maybe she's been corrupt this whole time. And maybe that's why there's been these attacks by the indigenous people. That's why these children are dying. That's why, because it's been rotten from the whole side and you're just like dismantling your system. So... There you go. So on March 23rd of 1692, a formal complaint is issued by John and Edward Putnam. We're going to read that warrant for apprehension. There being complaint this day made before us by Edward Putnam and Jonathan Putnam, yeomen both of Salem Village, against Rebecca Nurse, the wife of Francis Nurse of Salem Village, for vehement suspicion of having committed sundry acts of witchcraft and thereby having done much hurt and injury to the bodies of Anne Putnam, the wife of Thomas Putnam of Salem Village, Anna Putnam, the daughter of said Thomas Putnam, and Abigail Williams. 
You are therefore in their majesty's names hereby required to apprehend and bring before us Rebecca Nurse, the wife of Francis Nurse, tomorrow about eight of the clock in the forenoon at the house of Nathaniel Ingersoll in Salem Village. In order to her examination relating to the above premises and hereof, etc., etc., etc. Man, I uh, hope all of you were able to follow along with that. Uh, maybe that's the reason they're all such in bad and grumpy moods. If you have to write and talk like that. The way like they that. talked. <laughs> hey, that's a, a good moment just to to reference The Witch. Have you seen that movie? The the scary one yeah, with yeah, yeah, Anna yeah. Taylor Joy. It's the, the the goat. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um. What's his name? Uh. Black Black, Black, Adam. Black Billy or something. Black Adam. Black. No. Uh. Uh, and that's a superhero. Sorry. <laughs> um. Uh, what's it called? Ah, Philip Black Philip oh, Black Dan. Yeah. No, <laughs> we already that was last episode, bro. <laughs> Black Philip. But anyways, yeah. that movie you definitely have to put the subtitles on because it's a little difficult to follow the the dialogue. Yeah. yeah. But they are trying so hard to base it on the way these people actually talked so if you ever want like a good full representation of this 17th century uh jargon that is where you want to go but yes so edward and jonathan putnam go to the magistrates file their formal complaint uh, cite the attacks that have been happening to these girls and she is apprehended and uh one thing here that I would just want to make quick note of, uh, if uh, you recall in the Bridget Bishop episodes, how there was a huge laundry list of, of stuff. This rap sheet of these pre-accusations of, of witchcraft, of theft, uh, the, these brass mill pieces, the poppets in the house, the disagreements publicly, the shouting, the yelling, the the familiars, the the. the colorful creatures, the, the wolves, the cats, the, all these things. So they're bringing like, there's... This is like one or two spectral scenes to a couple girls. That's it. Yeah, it's very minimal. Yeah. Um, once again, it's surprising that the magistrates... He even gave it weight. Yep. Yeah. When they go to arrest her at her farm, it's very likely that she's bedridden at this point. Um, she's 71 years old. She's frail. And it's said that when she is told of the witchcraft uh, accusations and the tormenting of the girls, she believes it, right? Like, she's a very godly woman. Mm -hmm. Witchcraft is a part yeah. of her belief system growing up. Like, it's totally not normal, but it wouldn't be unheard of to hear that someone was afflicted. So she says she's going to pray for them. She feels for them. Then she's told that she is being accused and it's at that point that she says what sin hath god found out in me unrepented of that he should lay such an affliction on me in my old age she she really thinks that this is a punishment coming down she, on her for something that she may or may not have done that's how much she believes in this system yeah. she believes she has adhered to this belief system the way I play it out in my head, she's this old woman, she's sitting at home, you know, and now these men come knocking at her door, and she's incredibly pious, she's incredibly devout, and I think she's sort of, don't be silly, you know? Just imagine, like, an, an elderly woman, you come and you're like, you did this thing, she's like, oh, you must be mistaken, I'm sure, you know, God has, has he's playing a trick on you, this isn't actually what's going on, ha ha, how foolish, kind of narrative, is always sort of what I see. Uh, when I think about Rebecca Nurse. And then they're like, nope, this, this is serious business. Come on. And she's like, no, no, no. Like, this couldn't possibly be. And, of course, obviously using uh, the uh, uh, time-appropriate jargon. Mm -hmm. But I think she's just a little blind to, like, the reality of what's coming. Well, at this point, they I, can you blame her? No one's been no. executed. Like, like, the oh. trials haven't officially started Uh I think it would be shocking, though. I mean, she's at this point, she's 71, and they're going to throw her in jail. Yeah, it's okay. Um, but here we are. Of course, much to the protest of all of her family. Unlike a lot of the original accused, 
she does have a good network of individuals standing behind her in this. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit more detail in a second here. But I first want to talk about her pre-trial examination. So she's arrested on March 23rd. And inside the Salem Village Meeting House the following day, she will stand before Magistrates Corwin and Hathorne Mm -hmm. and uh, answer for these accusations. So when they question her, they they acknowledge her her piety. They acknowledge her position in the court, uh, and they are more respectful, I I think, is, is the baseline. Uh, but again, they're not dismissing it, but they're like, oh, this is Rebecca Nurse. We need to be a little careful here. She is a full uh, uh, covenant member of the church. And and then I guess sort of almost in correlation to that, the accusations are much more subtle. And they go through the short list of basic accusations. And I, again, I, I'm I just 330 years. How, how? How do you, how what? Spe- uh, all, a lot of it comes down to these spectral attacks on the girls. Yeah. Uh, one claims that they had been bitten by her, and I think it might have been a Putnam kid. The parents had seen the bite marks. Like, all you got to do is bite your arm and say, oh, right. my goodness, well, someone ah. bit me. Ah. Yeah. yeah, something similar, like or something simple like that could be blown out of proportion. And you'll see it in the courtroom, too. Like, they're not just having these fits prior to this questioning. Inside the courtroom, it's a bit of a circus. Uh, These girls, they're mimicking things that she's doing. She'll grab her neck, and the girls will all tilt their neck to the side and act as if she's trying to break their necks with some supernatural powers. I mean, it. and for, for these people who have grown up on this... This is terrifying it's to them. Validation it right. is what it is. Uh, so if they're already deep in this rabbit hole, and now all of a sudden they can see the evidence of their beliefs in front of them, and that—that's like for the most part the basis of these accusations. But there's one that kind of stands out a little bit, which is a little bit different. Do you want? Do you want to talk pigs, or I, I can talk pigs? Yeah. Lay, give us the pig story. The, the, the pig story. Um, so. I guess the important thing to understand in this narrative is what's actually going on, and that is a danger to your livelihood. So there is uh, this accusation by Sarah Holton that the specter of Rebecca Nurse has inflicted enough harm and damage on her husband, Benjamin Holton, to kill him. Uh, At this point, he is deceased. But the reason that she has spent her specter is because... Uh, the Holton's family's pigs had escaped on the nurse family farm and Rebecca nurse had uh, told her son to go kill the pigs. So getting back to what you were saying, this is a matter of livelihood. Those gardens that you have outside your home, that is your food. That's your sustenance. Yeah. If, if the, the neighbor's pigs come in and root through your vegetable garden, that's your dinner. It, it's not like, Oh shoot, you know, my, my vegetables have gone bad. I can go over to the grocery store and pick up some more you're going hungry. You would technically have the right to to kill those yeah, pigs. Absolutely. Um, and, and Sarah Holton will say, when the pigs were doing their rummaging, Rebecca threatened to have her son come and shoot those pigs. Which so, is completely within her legal right. Within her legal right, but then you also got to think about how significant that livestock is. And of course, Sarah Holton will say they didn't have adequate fencing and it really wasn't her pigs' fault. But going back to this narrative that we've touched on in previous episodes, something bad happens that you really have no it's just a something bad happens and and so it, it's after this pig disagreement which is not they don't actually kill the pigs they don't actually do anything it's just like a little verbal spat but her husband does uh get sick and he does pass away uh and uh, it was within a few days after this and he, and he started to, to fall down cramping and these issues and he takes ill and then he slowly deteriorates so to sarah holton's idea she's distressed she needs a reason why is my husband dying what on earth has happened and then she goes it was that damn nurse woman i roll and this is really some of the only 
I'm going to use air quotes here, physical evidence we have, something uh-huh. other, and it still is rooted in Rebecca Nurse's specter going out to attack him. But up until this point, they're really, it, it was mostly based on these young girls claiming they're seeing her spirit. But now we actually have adults coming forward and giving separate testimonies. And I do think that it's moments like these that really convinced uh, the jurors and the um, the court system in general to move forward with her prosecution. So we're going to pull just a quick excerpt from her examination on the 24th. And this is recorded uh, or transcribed by Reverend Paris. <clears throat> if you have confess and give glory to God, I pray God clear you if you be innocent. And if you are guilty, discover you and therefore give me an upright answer. Have you any familiarity with these spirits? No, I have none but with God alone. How came you sick? For there is an odd discourse of that in the mouths of many. I am sick to my stomach. Have you no wounds? I have none but old age. You do know whether you are guilty and have familiarity with the devil. And now when you are here, present to see such things as these testify, a black man whispering in your ear and birds about you, what do you say to it? It is all false, I am clear. Possibly, you may apprehend you are no witch, but have you not been led aside by temptations that way? I have not. What a sad thing it is that a church member here, and now another of Salem, should be thus accused and charged. But, you know, what I love about this is, it's very, like, what what the, the, the judges are saying here is very, you may be, perhaps people are saying there's words in the mouth, these other people, and she's like, no, I'm innocent. Very she's simply. very calm, cool, collected throughout the entire thing. Yeah. And we had mentioned how they are treating her slightly different. Yeah. It does feel a little bit more lax compared to Bridget Bishop. That initial line of questioning on March 1st, this one, they are not nearly being as forceful. Um, but, th- but they do point out the fact that she is a church member mm-hmm. and how sad of a situation this is. Not how impossible, not how ridiculous, not how just, oh, it, how sad that someone so great has fallen so hard. And you're like, really? Really, guys? In all seriousness, at this point, I really think that the Putnams, like no one, we all know no one wants to admit they're wrong. Mm-hmm. But no one wants to be like, oh, yeah, sorry. My kid was doing this all for show. My kid and my wife were doing this all for show. They're pointing the fingers and just making this big fuss for no reason. Like, no, Ooh. like... Because then that's going to get you in trouble. And you right. Da, da, da. So I... And I think that's... Mm, da, da, da. That's the case with the Putnams. I, I think... And, like, it's hard. Again, we're missing so much. Speculation. But Abigail Williams and Betty Paris, I think, are, are genuinely suffering. I think, perhaps... Suffering from what... Like initially, like, like the psychological distress of living in this community in that life in Reverend Paris's home. Okay. Um, yeah. Especially know, Abigail Williams. Especially what she's seen, what she's witnessed in her life. I think we only briefly mentioned she is a, a refugee. She had lost her family up um, during an indigenous attack up in, in Maine. Yeah. So At 11. At 11. And then you're living in Reverend Paris's home and he's practicing his sermons and he's preaching fire and brimstone and... and there's only so much any person, much less a child, uh, can take. But then, and I'm speculating here, so they, those girls are genuinely suffering a psychological uh, ailment. But then Ann Putnam and her daughter hear about this, and they're like, oh. And maybe not out of malevolence, maybe just out of... They see the attention that these girls are getting. Yeah. And you know, we've we've all seen... Monkey see, monkey do. I mean, I was gonna say like 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 uh, uh, TV shows with um parents, you know, like um w- with the kids, like the, the 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 talent, not the talent shows, the pageants. Yeah. Like you've seen the pageant shows, and how like one girl's like getting a little more attention, and the moms go, 
Yep. A, a little ballistic or sports games, right? You see parents at sports games, like with the debt and f- like physically like throwing hands over like a missed call. Like it gets a little crazy. We see it today. And, and you have your reputation, right? Yeah. Especially during this time where that is a very big, it's significant to them to have your child be acting in such a crazy way. Well, and, and, it, and they, it can't be for show. Yeah. And, and they see that. And then, and then it, it just soon, it, it, it's not even too, it's never too late. It, it's too late from the day it starts. And they just, they just keep pushing that narrative. So she's arrested on the 23rd. She'll have this examination the following day. We won't see her be put on trial until the end of June. So that means in between this time, the poor woman is spending every hour of every day in this terrible, terrible jail Horrid conditions. The fact that only a select few died during the entirety. that That's what's unbelievable. Yes. Oh, my God. Shocking. But during this time, we do have some developments. Her family isn't going to go down without a fight. So they bring uh, a petition or they, they get uh, members of the community to sign a petition, uh, specifically 39 people, and they bring it to the governor. We whose names are hereunto subscribed being desired by Goodman Nurse to declare what we knew concerning his wife's conversation for time past, we can testify to all whom it may concern that we have known her for many years, and according to our observation, her life and conversation was according to her profession, and we never had any cause or grounds to suspect her of any such thing as she is now accused of. Now, what I think is interesting to know about this petition, you notice they do not use the word witchcraft, not not even a little, no. not nothing. It's it's that. I think there is still that fear, right? They're si- they're putting their names on a list right here. And what if they're wrong? Right. What if the court decides to take that list and go after those people next? Yeah. They're sticking their own necks out for this. But I think that speaks once again to her piety and her reputation amongst her community. So uh, if you look at, at the list, you're going to see some interesting names. You're going to see some porters. You're going to see some Putnams, uh, big families here. Uh, now that's interesting to note. The Putnams are on both sides of this. So... I believe, and it does get a little complicated with the familial relations, but I'm pretty sure uh, her son-in-law is a half-brother to one of the main accusing Putnams. But aren't we all? Yeah, I mean, they're all they all have connections at this point, especially with the nurse family being so large. Yeah. Of course, they're going to have familial ties by marriage to a lot of folks in town. But I think. This whole idea of uh, feuding families and stuff, this does come into to effect in this story in particular. And I can only imagine the words that were exchanged between these groups of people. I mean, they still have to go to church every day. They have to pass each other on the road. They have to to engage with each other. It, you know, it's it's something that would have been in their day to day happenings. Yeah, we got Samuel so. Samuel Sibley, uh, and his of his wife, of course, uh, is the one who initially is watching those girls on that day and makes the witch cakes. It's just neat to, to see these names on, on this list and, and what the community sort of, that gives you a deeper understanding, which then makes it more confusing of what exactly the community was looking like at that time. This petition is dated May 1st, and there were several other statements made by um, leading members of the community for the days leading up to this petition. It's it's evident there is a full-fledged effort in this community to prevent the court from moving forward with her trial. They're pretty much pulling out all the stops. But they continue uh, regardless. Not, Not regardless. It's not dismissed. It's not like just thrown out. Yeah, we still have the petition. Yeah. It still exists, uh, but uh, it, unfortunately like, it does not. I, I would say it's taken into consideration, maybe, but anyway. One would hope. So uh, shall we move forward to the trial? Yes. A call for witnesses is issued on June 1st. 
and her trial will take place on June 30th, 1692, and she will be put on trial alongside Sarah Good, Elizabeth Howe, and Susanna Martin. Now, we did discuss how she, the evidence that's brought up against her is very different than what we've seen with uh, previous cases, specifically Bridget Bishop. You know, everyone had a story about Bridget yeah. doing something to their family, something to Dead their crops, yeah. attacks, their whatever, cattle, yeah. whatever. But of course, the evidence brought up against Rebecca Nurse, much more spectral in nature. However, she is forced to undergo a physical examination alongside Bridget Bishop. So this is like, sorry to jump back in time on you. Yes, uh, June second. Yeah. So this is this is held June second. Uh, about a month ago. So while uh, this is used as evidence uh, f- for Bridget Bishop, uh, I think it's kind of discounted that whatever mark they seem to find on on Rebecca Nurse. Um, it's sort of like, no, 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 that's a normal, uh, natural mark. Um, and I guess she, she gives one of the women investigating this mark uh, some explanation of a, a difficult birth. And the woman says, oh, that would very clearly explain uh, what we're seeing here. Just want to reiterate once again, and we, we dove into this on the Bridget Bishop episode. This is a straight up physical assault violation. They're taking her, this poor woman, who is probably the epitome of godliness. Uh, she is so devoted to the church and she lives by this in her daily life. And to have her be stripped down and searched is just such a a horrid violation. And once again, to reiterate, those, quote, excrements of flesh found between the pandendum and the anus, which would correlate with what she says, it was uh, something that happened during childbirth. The woman gave birth to eight children. So, and above all, she should know her body well enough to explain what this mark is. It is not a witch's teat where she suckles her animal familiar. It is just a uh, a part of her. But but in this case, they agree with her uh, for the most part. Um, and, and they're like, oh, that, that sounds reasonable and logical, and, and, and they move on. Uh, but once she's actually brought to trial, again, uh, it's now more likely that she's uh, sending her specter to bite 12-year-olds, obviously. Obviously. So they go through the trial, uh, and it's all pretty simple, pretty easy. But one thing that marks Rebecca Nurse in stark contrast to absolutely everyone else, right? This doesn't even I don't, no. No, is she is found innocent. Not guilty. By the jury. Yeah. Uh, Well, for a minute anyway. For a hot second, yeah. unfortunately. After testimonies are given, after the trial is conducted, the jury retreats to deliberate. Yeah. And, and they come back with a not guilty verdict. And sorry, I just want to correct myself, maybe. Uh, it's not that she's found innocent. That that That's not the, the thing that's rare. There, there are other, many other people that are found innocent. It's what happens next yes. that changes the game. Yes. When the jury announces that she is innocent, the courtroom erupts, much like her initial questioning where these children are claiming to be literally attacked right there in front of everyone else. They're going to start doing this again, and the whole courtroom is going to become a circus, and that jury is ordered to go back. And of course, they come back with a guilty verdict. Yeah, so basically... It comes down to a a, a question that she was asked about her association with uh, some other women. The jury wanted more clarification on a question that they had asked her or or she had said something that they they wanted more explanation on. So so basically it's are you or do you know these women? Are you with these women? And she responds uh, sort of with a yes. And that was contrived sort of in in two ways uh, because these women were also uh, accused of being witches. Yes, and we should note that she knew Sarah Osborne. uh, Yeah. Yeah. Um, But the the question that Rebecca Nurse answers is, yes, 
I was with these women in prison. I, I, I know them. We were, we were shackled together. We were arrested and, and we were together. She was not answering. Yes, we were together as witches. And that's sort of where the jury's like, well, what, what exactly was she saying? Was she saying she was yes with them as witches or yes with them as prisoners? And so they come back and they ask her again. And she doesn't answer. She, does, she just sort of sits there in, in, the, in the, the witness stand and looks a little lost. And it's sort of at this point that I can't help but, but wonder. We know she's hard of hearing. If there was not something else uh, wrong with her. Whether it is some type of mental degradation, you know, she is aging or, you know, that's just a high pressure situation. Right. She has no lawyer. She's sitting up in front of this entire congregation being accused of witchcraft. And there, now there. they're trying to ask her for clarification on a question that she may not have even completely understood to begin with. Yeah. And there's no, there's no typewriter. I mean, yes, we have these, you know, someone is taking down what's going on, but it's not like you can go back to the transcript and say, hey, what did you mean by this? And this is also a place where double jeopardy doesn't, that yeah. wouldn't happen today. Like you, you don't get a, a not guilty verdict verdict and say, oh, wait a minute. No, let's, go back and yeah, uh, think that over again. That doesn't happen. So she's sitting there, she's confused and, and she doesn't answer the question. And they're like, well, she can't answer it. She must be guilty, and, and now they find her, her guilty of being a witch. Um, I guess there is a, a petition afterwards where they talk to her, and, and, and she says, I, I, I didn't even hear them say that. I, I didn't even know that was asked of me. And they're like, can you imagine, like, in a court of law today, if, like, you have this you know, 71-year-old woman who's like, I, I didn't even know that they asked. I'm like, that's a lot. It's frustrating because there's so many things wrong with our court system in today's world. But at the same time, this is why we have appeals. Like if you have poor representation, if you, you know, evidence is tampered with or you find holes in the case, in, in the actual process itself, you can appeal your verdict. But in this situation. Yeah. So this one's very quick. So very easy. Uh, I mean, we, we got the innocent and then the guilty comes back. It's not like they deliberate for hours or days. Uh, it's pretty much overturned right away. And then within a few days, uh, she's excommunicated. So for Rebecca, I wonder if this would have been worse. Um, as a covenant member of the Church of Salem, this is basically revoking that um, and severing that tie that she has worked so long and so hard to form with God, with her church. And so in her mind, she is possibly damned, most likely damned. And I can't even imagine what was going through her head at that moment. No, and it, it's one of these narratives that you're like, we don't, I don't think we talk about enough uh, is, is excommunication. Right, so you're not just like, I mean, death is. So again, we have to like sort of come back to their uh, religious ideology. Death is not final. Uh, Rebecca Nurse, we mentioned before, she's a coveted woman within the church. She has spent her whole life reaching these measures and marks to assure her place in heaven, uh, and now that is stripped away from her, and so her death is not the end, but just the beginning of what is in her mind to literally be an eternity of, of suffering, which I, I can't, I, I know. And, and for those of you listening who, who do hold uh, some, some faith, uh, I do not. And I, I cannot wrap my brain around how hopeless. Yeah. The, the, so after the trial, after she's found guilty and excommunicated from the Salem Town Church. That petition that 39 members of her community had signed, that petition is sent down to the governor, Governor Phipps. Now, we've talked briefly about him in some of our previous episodes. Dude is very inexperienced, uh, shows up when there's 
dozens of people already in jail and sets up this court of Oyer and Terminer to preside over these witchcraft accusations. He will listen for a moment and he does reverse that guilty verdict. So technically, Rebecca Nurse is found not guilty two times. They had so many opportunities to bring an end to this. It's just do the right thing. And uh, they just, they can't, they can't not do it. And unfortunately. That is then. Rescinded. Yeah. He revokes it. Now, this is after some backlash seen by the girls, the afflicted girls, and also the Putnams. They will raise a bit of alarm. And also, there's a good chance that some of those judges that were sitting on that court of Oyer and Terminer, they've got a lot of sway with this new governor. So, very well could have been, no, 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 we should keep pursuing this um, full steam ahead. And that's what he does. But That's... Just about all for that concept of, of the trials uh, or within her trial. Um, and she will uh, then be uh, given an execution date of July 19th. She will maintain her innocence until the day she dies. Calmly. Respectfully, with utmost dignity. And really, I think this marks a turning point in the trials because someone who is a coveted member of the church. They are found guilty. They are executed. They are so much further in this than they have been up until this point. Unfortunately, it'll just keep going forward. But her story doesn't quite end there. Uh, There is an interesting thing that happens um, as as soon as she's executed, as soon as that night, we believe uh, that... Some members of her family uh, sail up the North River uh, all the way to Proctor's Ledge and recover her body. So because she, like the other victims, were found guilty of witchcraft, they are, they are not given a proper Christian burial. And as if the guilty verdict, as if the communi- excommunication wasn't enough, this is another component that is detrimental to her belief system Mm -hmm. and to her family. So the least they can do is go and retrieve her, and they do so. They bury her in a, uh, a forest, a grove, just off to the side of the property on that, that 300 acres. And, it's um it's technically oral tradition, but it has gone on since the beginning of yeah. So you it, know, it's outside so. of their family plot, it's not like they bring her back to the house and bury her and like have a, a big ceremony. Right. You got to keep it quiet. Yeah, it's it's not consecrated ground. It's not officially like designated as as like the family plot. It it's off of any of that semblance in an unmarked grave. Yeah. And part of why the family has passed this down is her son and husband would both request to be buried alongside her in that spot as well. Um, And you can actually go see that burying point, um, which we will talk about. But that's, I've always found that to be an interesting narrative because um, while there were likely a few others uh, whose bodies were were recovered, um, she was the first. uh, And it sort of shows that regardless of the court system, those closest to her uh, maintained her innocence. And we have this double down. We have this with the petition. We have this with, with the public outcry. Uh, so it, it, it goes from when she's arrested, when she's alive, the petition that's brought, the request of the governor, and then even after her death, they're like, no, not a chance. Uh, we're, we're, we're confident in, in her innocence. Um, and whereas which many other people who were executed were believed to be witches. And are just eternally disregarded. Yeah. So we have yet to mention the fact that her two sisters were actually accused as well. So we don't want to dive into a full backstory on their families in particular. Um, Maybe we'll save that for this time next year. Mm -hmm. But just real quick, Mary Esty and Sarah Cloyce. So both of them are That's her two other sisters uh, from the town family. And there had been speculation that their mother, Joanna, had been accused of witchcraft the generation prior. And of course, in this world, 
they very much believed that you could pass on that godliness. So the fact that Joanna could have been a witch, oh my gosh, it just gives fuel to the fire. Which, which is also um, one of those, and, and sometimes we uh, draw the correlation between uh, historic ideology and modern pop culture. Um, so if we look at stories today, uh, that revolve around witches in our, our pop culture. One of your favorites, Charmed. You know, all the girls and the grandkids, they are descendants of witches. That gives them, you know, inherent witch power. Um, so it's sort of, it's exactly what's going on here. Very nice Charmed reference. Yeah. I like that. <laughs> Very nice. But it's but so often we, we see these these stories today and we just accept them as pop culture. And there's but they are rooted in historical evidence. Yeah. No. Hundred percent. Yeah. And it's unfortunate because it was just it was just another little little detail that added to their to them looking guilty. Mm-hmm. Both of them are accused of witchcraft uh, by the girls. Rebecca's the oldest, then Mary, then Sarah Cloyce. Mary's around fifty eight years old at this point, and uh, Sarah Cloyce is about fifty five. Both of them will submit a petition on September 9th. Uh, to the court, which is, of course, denied Mm -hmm. uh, a petition of their innocence. And then Mary Esty, 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 I jump back and forth, apologies. She, on September 15th, will submit another formal petition directly to Governor Phipps. Now, I did want to read just a really brief excerpt from that one. I petition your honors, not for my own life, but I know I must die and, uh, and my appointed time is set. But the Lord, he knows it is that no more innocent blood be shed. The Lord above that is the searcher of all hearts knows that as I shall answer at the tribunal seat, I never knew the least thing of witchcraft. So even while she is staring death in the face, she is pleading that they do not spill any innocent blood beyond her. She already has accepted her fate. She's like, I'm to die, but please stop killing everyone else. Heartbreaking. Mary Esty will be executed on September 22nd. One of the uh, eight firebrands of hell, as they were called by Reverend Noyce. The largest of the executions to happen and the last, and the last. as well. Thankfully, um, I say thankfully, but you know, how happy, what, what life do you have after this? Sarah Cloyce, she is released after spending at least nine months in prison. One thing I did want to know about her in particular, it seems that it is her standing up for her sister that gets her accused to begin with. So on Sunday, March 27th, so this is just after Rebecca Nurse is arrested and questioned. Samuel Paris will lead a sermon, and the topic is very much centered on the idea of the devil being inside the church. So, of course, a direct reference to Rebecca Nurse's uh, accusations. Sarah Cloyce will get up and walk out of that meeting house and slam the door behind her. She will be... That's uh, not a good look. No. She will be accused just a couple days later when Abigail Williams... Again. Again, niece of Reverend Paris, details this gathering of 40 witches, a mockery of the uh, Lord's Supper in which Sarah Cloyce and Sarah Good are both divvying out flesh and blood for the witches to feast upon. It's this horribly um, grotesque imagery for these people, but it's just enough to get her, get her accused, and she is arrested by April 11th. I feel for Sarah Cloyce so much. Um, I think about her quite often while I'm giving my tours to lose both your sisters, uh, spend that time in jail, not knowing if you're going to be next, and um, it's just it. It speaks to the aftermath. I think people forget about what happens to these families after it's over. Mm -hmm. People have lost siblings, parents, grandparents, spouses, sisters. But when it comes to what happens afterwards, Rebecca Nurse is again somewhat unique. 
in, uh, in what follows. So, of course, the family, the nurse family in particular, is, uh, for lack of a better word, pissed. Um, and they are not going to just let this go. Mm -hmm. uh, they are very active in trying to oust Samuel Paris from his position as reverend in, in Salem Village, and they are successful. He'll end up leaving Salem in 1696. Can I add just, just, just real quick? Uh, he goes uh, to Stowe, which I'm probably going to be over in Stowe in a couple of weeks, I, I think. Uh, and then he goes to Dunstable, which is the next town over from Groton, where I grew up. So uh, he was in Dunstable for like two or three years, I think. Uh, but when I started to do the trial stuff, it's just, I was like, oh, uh, wait yeah, a minute. Yeah, right over there. Uh, I, I think that church there on the hill uh, is where Reverend Paris was practicing. So that's kind of cool. That's kind of crazy. Yeah, yeah. Small, small New England stuff. Salem is so small. New England, so small. Yeah. Salem back then. It was huge. I was going to say even smaller. It was four times the size. Yeah, but people, population. Pe Population-wise was, you know, micro. A fraction. Yeah, but the land itself was big. The nurse family is also unique in that they are mentioned in a public apology that is issued perhaps one of the only written accounts of an accuser where they outrightedly admit that this was false. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm trying to be careful about how I, I phrase this because this is written by Ann Putnam Jr. And as much as it is an apology, she doesn't own up to it completely. She blames it on the devil. She says the devil made her do it, basically. Yeah. Um, so one thing, a lot of things, I always say one thing and I go on to say like five things um, that I, I really like or I think this sheds light on is that we can look at the severity of uh, Ann Putnam Jr. and Putnam and her father, their accusations leveled across the city. And now she's the only one coming forth and she's not being like my parents are crazy, but she's like, we screwed up. And I, I think that speaks to the the severity of what she did and whether or not she can really fully work through that trauma and admit uh, the situation. I don't think so. But I think this really uh, sheds light on, onto that situation. And I also wonder, though, to what degree she did this because she was just trying to get in good faith with the church. So this is part of her trying to become a member of the church. Yeah. And of course you have to admit some of your past transgressions and this is one of them. So publicly in front of a congregation, she will give this apology in 1706 and she directly references Rebecca nurse and her sisters. Um, it's a pretty interesting statement um, she says, I didn't do it out of anger or malice, uh, you know, sort of when I was a child, my family did this and it, she doesn't desire to lie or be humbled before it. It's, it's this sort of like deep regret, um, but no real admission, uh, which I, I think is probably in line for, for that time in history. And especially like of a woman uh, at this point in her stature. And it's like she recognizes the ill will, but doesn't genuinely uh, apologize for the actions she took. But at the same time, she was 12. Right. I, that, I mean, I can bear, I don't even want to, what was I doing when I was 12? Riding my bike around, you know, playing with sticks. <laughs> and it's not like you're going to come right out and say, my dad told me to say this, or my yeah. mom told me to do this. That's just not going to happen. Yeah. Um, but it it is interesting, and again, it comes back to the the incredible uniqueness of Rebecca Nurse's situation. Uh, and so, at the end, at the end of all of that that we've covered so far, here we have her prime accuser coming forth and being like, "We were in the wrong." So, at the end of the day, I mean, obviously, we all know uh, that no one was a witch, but from the mouth of the accuser. It was not Rebecca Nurse. And I do think that speaks a lot to her family and the efforts that they made to make sure her name was cleared and yeah. stayed cleared in their in their homes, in their communities. Yeah. It is very tight knit. You're seeing these people every day 
post trials. So they were sure to make sure that Rebecca Nurse was not viewed as a witch moving forward. So this was 1706, and then this comes uh, just a few years before the actual legal exoneration. Yes, so they're going to petition the government for a reversal of those charges. Um, And nearly 20 years after her death, her name will be cleared along with several others. And they get uh, some money in recompense, I believe 25 pounds. I think it's 20. 20? Mary Esty said 20. So I think everyone got the same amount. Oh, okay. I'm not sure. We'll have to look into that. We'll look into that. We'll look into that. (laughs) Mary Uh, Esty got 20 pounds. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure how much Rebecca Nurse's family got. But this is one of those situations where I think we touched on in Bridget Bishop's episode. You had to go forward and, and claim that. You had to petition the government. Mm-hmm. It's not like they were just handing this out. Yeah, yeah. You had to make it a point to get that name cleared. And for some of these folks, especially those original uh, cues, those outcasts that don't have a lot of family, they are not going to see their names cleared until the early 2000s, like believe it or not. Bridget Bishop episode, remember her daughter dies in 1693. So she's not, her name's not even on this petition. Uh, but once, once that petition's done and cleared, the following year, they reverse her excommunication yep and now she lives on in legend by the same reverend that oversaw her excommunication reverend noise i wonder how he felt i wonder how all the judges felt well we know how one of them felt well yeah uh that that would be uh i was referencing uh magistrate saltonstall who leaves the court of Oyer and Terminer after Bridget Bishop's yeah. execution. He's the only one. Only one. Um, and, and also what's, again, just one of these other really cool things about uh, Rebecca Nurse is the Rebecca Nurse homestead in Danvers is still standing, and you can go and visit the home in, that she lived in, uh, and you can go see the ground in, in which she's buried. And uh, we did that. Yes, we did. So this is technically the only... A home belonging to a witch trial victim that you can actually go tour. It is open to the public. I will also mention too, she, did you know that she has a day dedicated to her? It's probably like the, one of the cool little side note. No, I did not. Yeah. On July 19th, 2017, our governor, Charlie Baker, designated July 19th as Rebecca Nurse Day. So if you are listening to this on the day it drops uh, and you're in Massachusetts or anywhere, that's Rebecca Nurse Day. And take a moment to reflect. Yeah. This was probably one of the saddest moments. All of the victims, their stories are sad. But I think as the matriarch of her family, uh, someone who had been a pillar in her community, had done so much good and really... I would guess saw the good in people, saw the good in life for her to be taken away from that family. It's just, um, it's probably one of the saddest ones of them all. So we're actually going to continue this conversation. Um, not with you all, unfortunately, you're going to have to wait just a little bit longer, but we went and took a field trip to Danvers. We visited the Rebecca Nurse Homestead and a couple other locations in what once was Salem Village. So we're going to end this episode and in just a couple weeks, you will be able to hear our little overview of that field trip and what visiting Rebecca Nurse's property was like. Before we go, I did want to leave you with just a couple quick reference materials. If you are still interested in doing some research on Rebecca Nurse, Marilyn K. Roach has a wonderful book called Six Women of Salem. Um, and, and alongside Tichaba, Bridget Bishop, um, Sarah Good, she profiles Rebecca Nurse think, because she is so unique. I think that's one of my favorite people. I go, what books should I read? And I always say Marilyn uh, Roach's other book, uh, which is the day-by-day account of the Salem Witch Trials. I reference that all the time. But that is literally just like a copy and paste isn't the right right word. But of the Salem Witch Trials, this happened on this day, in this room, this is what occurred. Six Women of Salem is, it's not historical fiction. 
right? So I don't want to like propagate that narrative, but it gives a lot of flavor. Right. Right. So it's like, you know, in the morning, the sun rose and the dew was on the grass. You could smell the, the, the fish in the air. And, you know, so it gives you sort of a, a better understanding of probably what their lives were like and what they went through on a daily basis and how they felt. And it is all, you know, unequivocally based in, in a hundred percent historical accuracy. Uh, but it's, it's got a really cool feel to it. Yes. If you, if you see anything with Marilyn K. Roach on it, you can pretty much guarantee that it's, it's, it's the, the it's, real deal. Yeah. You're good. You're good. Another one is called A Salem Witch, The Trial, Execution, and Exoneration of Rebecca Nurse by David Gagnon. Um, so this is technically the first full biography of her life. Uh, it's kind of stunning that no one has done this thus far, but I don't think we have one for any of the victims at the moment. So if you're looking to just dive headfirst into her story, I would check that out. And then if you're not looking to read, you can head on over to Amazon and watch Three Sovereigns for Sarah. Now, that was a three-part documentary series that was produced by PBS back in the 80s. Um, it, it's a great, it is a great depiction of the trials. I appreciate it so much in that it, it showcases how wild these young girls were acting, how how erratic these fits were, and it gives you an idea of the the circus that was taking place and the fear that it generated. And uh, also, real quick, the meeting house from Three Sovereigns for Sarah is the meeting house that is on the Rebecca Nurse Homestead property. Yes. So I, I was going to save that for the next oh, episode. Oh. It's okay. Cut, it's okay. Cut, no, cut it. Cut no. it. Cut it. Cut it. Stick, I'm going to leave it. Ah. I'm going to leave it. A little teaser. <laughs> little teaser for what's yeah. coming uh, in a the, in the couple weeks. But that wraps everything up. So we hope you enjoyed this little overview of Rebecca Nurse's life and her time during the trials. Just remember to be good to each other. And um, if you do see something that's happening that's wrong in your community and and someone is being persecuted, speak up against it. Yeah. I, I got nothing but agreement. I, I, I can. <laughs> Huzzah. 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 Uh, so thanks for listening. See you later. Mm-hmm.